I mean, I, I, um, these things always go better the more conversational they are, I think. So yep. feel free to, to redirect and, and uh, all that. That won't throw me off at all. Absolutely. Uh, uh, no, I, you know, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> okay. With that, um, this is Talking with the Presses, Episode 8, presented by Poetry London Online. This week with co-founder, publisher, and editor of Gaspero Press, Andrew Steves. Andrew, thank you again for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, so to begin, I wonder, um, with what vision did you found Gaspero Press with Gary Dunfield in 1997? What was your getting into this? Minimal, minimal vision. <laughs> I, you know, looking back at it, I, I've always sort of puzzled of why we thought it was a good idea at all. I mean, um, you know, it's not like there was a lack of literary magazines. We started off initially, you know, with this plan to do a, this literary journal called the Gaspar Review, which we did 16 issues or something ultimately. And, um, and uh, also then to publish some books. And I mean, I, I don't know why we thought that was a good idea. The only thing I, looking back, the only thing I've been able to think about uh, that makes any, you know, partial explanation for that was that I had done a master's thesis on uh, Alden Nolan. Mm. And what I had done is I'd, I'd found this, I was actually writing what a short fiction. And, um, but when I was doing my, my research, I found a whole bunch of letters that he'd written. And uh, they were all out of order and, you know, all this sort of stuff. So I ended up like putting these in order and annotating them and writing this introduction. Um, and in the process, I mean, you know, he was writing to another writer and talking about writing in journals and all this kind of stuff. So it became this kind of crash course in what is going on in Canadian small press and journals, you know, through the 60s and 70s and early 80s. Alden died in about 84, I think. And uh, so for some reason, that, that got under my, got into my head, I guess, mm -hmm. and when we I met Gary uh, just around town. We had kids the same age and stuff, and you know he was working. Uh, he was a stay-at-home dad, and also had like a a, a business, make, you know, doing accounting software for farmers. So didn't want to move from DOS to Windows, so um, uh, that should give you an idea how long ago that was. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was doing freelance journalism largely, and uh, a little sessional work at, at the university here just trying to figure out how to make a living right and uh, we just jumped into it so you know was there a strong vision I, I, there was a curiosity I think uh, and there was I think also a sense that there was maybe you know despite everything that had gone on since the 1960s there still really was not enough strong voices from outside of Vancouver mm. that uh, regionalism I think in the late 90s even was still more of an issue than it is today. Hmm. Uh, and so there was this strong kind of rural uh, ethos, I think it worked. So um, in those letters of Nolan's that you discovered, um, you mentioned that he was sort of discussing the nature of small press publishing in Canada. Were there like particular criticisms or strengths that he identified in small press publishing that maybe informed to some extent this curiosity? Uh, not in particular. I mean, it, it's all the same problems, you know, that, that writers have still of, you know, trying to find a sympathetic ear, you know, mm. and, um, uh, and having their own sort of grievances and gripes and, and certainties that they never even looked at it, you know, like all these kinds of, of insecurities and, and concerns, uh, certainly, uh, you know, what, what sort of foreshadowed what I would see, you know, in 23 years now of, of editing and, and selecting work um, mm. in terms of how writers cope with that whole process of you know being selected or not being selected so yeah I, again I, it, it, like I said it, it it was I think that there you know in some ways we may well have been driven more by this desire to make things than we were by some purely aesthetic uh, you know because I I didn't you know if you look at our earliest books I mean you, you don't it takes a year or two to start to see the kind of kind of sense of design and the look that that mm. we've developed mm. over time. Initially, you know, it's just kind of like everything, you know, what, whatever was cheap and easy. Like, you know. and gradually, um, I, mean, I grew up, I grew up in a construction household, 
in New Brunswick, you know, where my grandfather had a construction business. And, and I grew up around climbing over Caterpillar tractors and on job sites and mm. stuff. And so um, and I also grew up at a drafting table. That's what my father used to bring home, you know, back then before the internet was a big deal. Uh, there was this thing called a sweet spile. It would be like a, a manual with every window and door available commercially and, and all the spec. And so my, my uh, brother James and I would be drawing <laughs> houses, you know, for the hell of it with perfectly spec windows and doors <laughs> at the age of 14 or 15. And so I, I grew up in that context. So when it came time to design books, even though I didn't have any formal training, I had this, this notion of how things are made, you know, and, and, and it didn't take me too long, you know, looking around at other books, you know, not so much Canadian books. So certainly Coach House was a big influence. The early ECW, uh, early Oberon, they were the kind of things that, that attracted me more than what was happening at the moment. Because I saw in them this tactility that interested me. And, uh, and that really drew, drew me in. So it gave me a basis of work. Um, so... You know, over the course of those 25 years, um, before then, ostensibly previously untutored as you were, um, but being familiar in how to sort of construct things in three dimensions, um, you've received some 50, 50 citations for excellence in Canadian book design by the Alcuin Society. And as anyone who has encountered a Gaspro book knows, these books are of incomparable material quality and beauty. And I wonder if you'd discuss the importance of the book as art object. Um, there are other components of this question, but I think that that will suffice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And um, I'm going to redirect that slightly mm -hmm. simply because, uh, you know, as a tradesperson, I'm always uncomfortable with this notion of art. Right. But it's a short, you know, I, you learn, uh, I've learned over the years to uh, smile and nod when people say it instead of get into some argument with people about what art is. But, mm -hmm. but uh, because it meant in the best sense, I, th I think people recognize um, when something is thoughtfully made uh, and made fit to its purpose, um, we don't have a lot of language to talk about what, what that is. So we often say it's art. You know that that uh, and uh, and we talk about beauty, and really from the beginning, um, the thing that it's interested me is is really uh, fitness to purpose and mm -hmm. and robustness, and so you know I'm I'm I think of books as being uh, in the same category of tools as like a good pencil or a hammer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about what we do having more to do with uh, more kind of affinity with uh, a well-hung door, you know, that opens and closes as it should, right. uh, than it does, uh, you know, with with uh, high art. In that sense. So, but yeah, it, it didn't. I I don't know. I I when I looked around at you know the library really was my teacher because um, there wasn't a lot of people that I could talk to you about designing books. And, and so I just went and looked at books and I looked at like, so why does this appeal to me and this doesn't? Why does this seem to, why does this feel wrong in my hand but this feels right in my hand? Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I just spent hours and hours and hours in the stacks, you know, at the university library. Really. And, uh, and then later, you know, dug deeper into, you know, or, you know earlier and finer printing, you know, at places like Fisher Rare Book Library in Toronto, Massey College, mm. and, and just to try to understand what was going on. What was I looking at? Why did that make, why did these, this book make sense and this one didn't? And with the goal not to sort of bedazzle books, you know, but to actually make mm -hmm. them robust enough to, for their job. I mean, if, if a book, you know, so often, I think particularly in Canadian literary publishing, um, you know, there's a kind of thrift that kind of takes over that isn't actually a thrift. It, it it's a it's a cousin of the sort of corporate thinking that you know that 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 is simply a spreadsheet kind of economics. You know that doesn't look at the sort of longevity and you know, what is the job of this thing over time and how do we equip it to do that in a sensible way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we end up either making books cheaper, we make them pretty, but but we don't make them robust. Mm. 
and so it's that robustness that I'm really after. Interesting. Um, well, I mean, in addition to the books enduring um, as objects, and um, you've also got the quality of the language inside mm. it, and it seems like, um, I mean, creating books fit to purpose, as you say, uh, is there's a dialogue with the extent to which, I mean, poets and writers will drive themselves up and down the wall um, debating whether a colon or a semicolon need be in a particular place. Yeah. And whether if they go to the <laughs> semicolon, that means it has to be consistent throughout the manuscript and so they have to have a rewrite and so forth. Um, it seems to me in a way to be like an ultimate nod towards the craftspersonship of the writing itself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you're working sort of in tandem with that. Um, you know, so often we've thought about publishing, particularly in the modern era, and particularly in Canada, as a sort of this pragmatic, necessary evil in a way, as well as, you know, that we have writing, particularly literary writing is this um, rarefied, you know, activity, uh, this cultural activity, and but we'll have to get involved with this money grubbing, you know, <laughs> company over here, because they have the access to the marketplace, and they have the capital to produce things, and they have you know, all of that stuff, you know, and oh, well, we'll just have to uh, contend with that. And so publishers become, you know, contrary to what they started out as, I think, you know, over the, you know, the centuries, publishers then become merely a kind of delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. And we don't sort of equip, you know, publishing with um, the same kind of wily uh, skill. We don't, we don't sort of expect of publishing to be an equal partner in the creative sense. And we just, you know, some of them make prettier books than others and that's as good as it gets. And I don't really accept that. And I, I think that particularly in the cultural context when publishing is done well, the work that you do as a publisher, both at the editorial level, but also at the design and the production level, but also at the marketing level needs to be every bit as, you know, turned on and, and creative as, uh, as, as that act of writing the work. And if, if it isn't, you get a diminished return on, on this investment you know, in the culture. Uh, yeah. I mean, so speaking of the question of capital, did the audio just distort Julia for a second? It sounds like there's a weird echo. Anyway, I think we're all right. Speaking of capital, okay. Speaking of capital, I wonder uh, if you could say a few words about the, um, the machine behind you. <laughs> that is a linotype machine. That is a uh, late Victorian technology. And this machine was built in the thirties, if I remember correctly. And essentially it's, it's a, uh, it was an improvement on hand setting type. So there were a couple of systems and the linotype was one of them in, in the 1880s that came along that allowed the mechanization of the assembling of type. And so it actually, uh, moves mat matrices around with the mold, you know, the mold for the letter form, and you type a line essentially, and then you can cast that line in molten metal, which hardens instantly, and then you put that that slug or that line on on a printing press and print it. Now, obviously, we don't do most of our trade books uh, using any component of that, but I do a lot of letterpress printing as either for jackets or as, as other standalone projects. So, so it's, yeah, it's not a, what you would normally encounter. I may be the only Canadian publisher with a line of type in his office, other than maybe uh, Oberon Press probably still does it. So um, speaking of like the craft of the production of the book itself being um, different, but equivalent in terms of uh, attention to detail to the craft of writing the work itself, I'm wondering whether, well, whether you vary the the ways in which the books are actually published in accordance with the type of work that's contained within the covers, which is to say, do you use different technologies and different processes for different books based on those projects? Yeah, that yes, that, um, that's true. I mean, we do uh, oh, the number of levels of things that we do, but but in broad strokes, you know, we have our trade list of fourteen books that we do each year, and our goal is to keep those kind of in an affordable price ranges so they can get go out in the normal trade, you know, indigo chapters and the, the independence and, um, and sell, you know, for the price of a extra large pizza or whatever. I mean, it's something that people can access and in a reasonably uh, uh, infinite 
you know, press rata ultimately, that you can just keep making them as long as there's a demand. So those books we tend to print using, a, they're designed, you know, digitally. Uh, uh, they are, you know, printed on a modern, uh, relatively speaking, uh, printing press, and they are uh, sewn and bound, you know, into a into a cover in a, with a paper jacket. And that jacket is often printed letterpress just because I like to sneak some of that antiquated technology into a modern object just because mm -hmm. it undermines the attempt by many people to, to uh, relegate that to the, to the rarefied. Um, so, but if you buy a $20 Gasper Press book, odds are you're going to have a little bit of letterpress printing in it for no extra cost. Mm. And uh, that's just the kind of mischief I like to get up to. <laughs> and on top All of that- is to persist, may I say. Yeah, well, <laughs> on top of that, um, you know, I do a number of projects each year, you know, from broadsides to chapbooks, to hardcover limited editions that are top to bottom uh, typeset in metal and wood type and uh, printed in a small edition and at a higher price. Mm. And if you're inter into that, you can access that as well. I mean, so, so we do have this range and we do like to, we do make decisions about when a project comes in and it's sometimes a problem. Well, a really good example is I did a book a couple of years ago. I found, a, a, a hidden in plain sight, a uh, text of John James Audubon, the famous naturalist, uh, spent a week you know, moving through Nova Scotia on his way back from, from uh, the north, mm. where he'd been mm -hmm. shooting birds and stuff. And I found this text, and I thought, man, that'd be a great letterpress book. It's not too long, and it's, you know, and I... I, in my research of deciding to annotate this text to explain who and where and what he was talking about, I ended up working with another author who's a, a, a biologist and was a, kind of an expert in the field and asking him about a footnote. His answer was so complete, I said, hey, would you like to just do this yourself? Because you know more about it than I do. So he ended up writing this extraordinary uh, introduction and this extraordinary notes. Hmm. And when he handed these over to me, I thought, I can't make a, a $200 book with this. I want more people to read it. Mm. So we made a $20 book. Mm. And, um, you know, put all the love and attention into it still, and it's a still a, a, a great object. But but you do always have that that push-pull of, of uh, deciding to do it one way or the other alters what audience you can reach, who, who's able to engage with it. I, I've just finished a huge project probably the biggest book I'll ever do. It's a 150 original letterpress prints of wood type that spans the entire collection that I have here. Largely, it came from a guy named Glenn Galuska, who died a number of years ago in Montreal and had left me his type. And so I had determined that, I mean, he'd never got through everything he collected. And I determined I was not going to suffer the same fate. So I, I, I want to do this book and print one showing of every case of type in the collection. Mm -hmm. And there are quotations and there are abstracts and there are all kinds of things. And um, but it's a it's a huge book. It's a folio. It's you know 18 by 12 and it's 150 original prints and multiple colors. It took me three years to kind of work away grabs it does. I mean I can't sell that for twenty dollars. And so it's an addition of 26 copies and and uh, they're you know twenty five hundred bucks. And and that grieves me. <laughs> Like there's a piece of me that's like, yep, it's the only way you can do this particular thing is do it this way. But there's a piece of me that just feels ashamed and embarrassed because it seems like a lot of money and it seems, you know, and, and most people won't ever see it. So uh, you're always, if you're engaged in the kind of, um, you know, rarefied side of this a little bit, you, you're always in that push pull of, of do I steer this project towards the democratic trade edition or do I steer this towards some beautiful, gorgeous art thing that, most people will never see. It's, it's true. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of the, well, um, just in case there's anyone in the, in the audience who'd be interested in picking it up, um, the uh, Autobahn's book. What's what's its title? What's its title through Gaspro? Oh, I think I think it was a really really complex title, like Autobahn in Nova Scotia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember right. <laughs> Capacious. <laughs> it was a couple of years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric Mills was the was the author or the editor, and uh, Wesley Bates did a series of. I think four engravings for us that we used in the book. Excellent. Um, so uh, you've mentioned the number 14 of the uh, books that you publish annually, trade books that you publish annually. 
And I understand that you receive between three and 400 submissions per year. And I was wondering if you'd say a few words about not only what you look for in those 14, but also how you um, win of the 14 out of the last 20 when you're sitting around the editorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain number of submissions that come in that are just evidently not, you know, we don't do children's books. We don't really do um, books where the text is not the primary driver. So don't do like, you know, really books of visual art per se or cock table books. But, so there's a certain number of things that come in mm. uh, that where people have either not paid attention to what we do or they're just taking a Hail Mary, you know, throw here. Yeah. And w which is really quick and easy to determine. We're not gonna do. So that maybe, you know, winnows down the first hundred. <laughs> um, but from there, it, it's, it really is a harder thing to describe. I mean, ultimately, you are looking for a certain level of uh, craftsmanship, mm -hmm. you know, it's the people who know their way around a sentence and, and have something to say with that sentence. Mm -hmm. um, I have been trying to think over the years about what the organizing principle is, um, and it is a very weird thing to look back over your own work and try to understand what you're doing. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that I seem to be very interested in people who are writing about the time and the place in which they stand and, and are able to do that with some originality um, and some confidence in their voice. Um, so whether, you know, whether that's a rural place or an urban place, uh, whether that's a literal place or a figurative place, I, I'm... I'm interested in people who are engaged and paying attention. Um, I think that I think that's been the organizing principle when I look back. But but you know, really, um, there are so many works that come in that are reasonably good. You know that 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 really any publisher could pick them up and publish them, and there wouldn't be an embarrassment. It wouldn't be an, an outlier on the list. As as but are lacking somehow that last say 10% mm. and um, and what makes up that 10% is often um, sort of a clarity of thinking an originality of thinking clarity of voice there are so many poems out there I think you know we've I think in an effort to employ writers, <laughs> we have done ourselves a disservice by the sort of ramping up of the creative writing industrial complex that's out there. You know, the fact that universities have figured out that a student in their 20s would so much rather express themselves than read somebody else's work. And they have kitted that out into a way to sell a product. And that product is the creative writing degree. Right. So instead of actually going and spending four years of reading mm. and talking and thinking about what you're reading, we now invite people to come and just talk about themselves, express themselves. And some of them, you know, are interesting and are, have something to express. And some of them are, are just not, have not got there. They're, they've not lived enough. They've not, yeah. Uh, yeah. and they have not found models like me in the library trying to figure out why does this book, you know, design wise work and that one not work. They, the, a lot of these students have not read enough to really be able to discern, you know, and so um, a lot of the submissions that I receive have the taint, <laughs> mm -hmm. the stench of, of the creative writing industrial complex all over them. And in fact, they signal it to you in their cover letter as they say, this has been, that, you know, I was this workshop with <laughs> Lerner Crozier and this workshop with Don Mackay and this workshop with, you know, all fine writers there's nothing wrong with those writers but mm. but it's it's um i don't care <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to see i want to read that first page and i want to think huh <laughs> yeah. uh, as opposed to reading another perfectly good uh thing that sounds kind of like a poem it walks like a poem you know it quacks like a book. Like, you know, there's so much there's so much work out there that fulfills the basic requirement. And 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 mm -hmm. those things so quickly fall away. And it's so heartbreaking because it's hard. You can't in a in a rejection letter. There isn't the it's not the right time. Right. And it's there really isn't the 
resources on our end, you know, to to try and talk people through that. You know, hey, you know, clearly you're interested and clearly you have some skills. So throw away everything you've done and dig deeper. Mm-hmm. You know, and and see where that goes. See see whether that you can learn, un- unlearn what you've taught, mm-hmm. unlearn the, mm-hmm. the workshop, and and just write. I can't imagine a better note to end on, Andrew. I see at the same time our time has run out. So uh, oh. <laughs> I, I I feel like we could speak for some time. I've been instructed by the by the Poetry London Board to keep these to 20 to 25 minutes. Otherwise, they would be watchable. I'll come back another time. We'll talk about a different topic. (laughs) I look eagerly forward to that. This has been episode eight of Talking with the Presses this week with co-founder, publisher, and editor of Gasparo Press, Andrew Steves. Andrew, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Take care.